Uh, and maybe we can start here with you, Todd, if you could introduce sure. yourself and your fund. All right, I'm Todd Kimmel from Montage Ventures. We're a $25 million seed stage fund. We do uh, early stage investments in financial services, healthcare, and e-commerce marketplaces. I'm Ben Savage from Clock Tower Ventures. We're a small fintech only fund uh, associated with a bunch of capital markets professionals based in Los Angeles. All we do is fintech. I'm Alex Davidov, I'm an investor with uh, Core Innovation Capital. We're a fintech focused fund investing in companies that create value for American consumers and small businesses. Uh, invest in seed and series A, uh, LA and based in LA and SF, but invest all over the country. I'm Jay Reinemann, a partner over at Propel Venture Partners, a fund that's about 90 days old now. Uh, we've got a US fund that's an SBIC fund, so we're, we're a bit of a startup ourselves. Um, and we're working on an EU fund, uh, the US fund that's going to be going in funds for our company. So a little bit of a different goal for All right, great. Um, well, let's kick it off with this this way. FinTech. Uh, FinTech is hot right now. It's been hot for a couple of years. You've all been investing in venture for much longer than that. Um, we're seeing a, a shifting of the winds in other venture uh, uh, categories. How do, you, how do you guys see this infecting your portfolio companies and, and the companies that are pitching you in general? I'll start. I think um, it hasn't affected the FinTech market that much, frankly, um, in the sense that Great companies are still getting funded. There's a little bit of a bifurcation of assets around quality. So are a harder time, although I think you're seeing that express more through valuation than if anything, it's just di di dilated the time it takes for companies to get their round. In general, there seems to be a little bit of price that clears to get for later stage companies. Um, you know, it'll get really bad when there isn't a price that clears. At the seed stage, it's Even at the, the, the latest um, and getting and getting done and fintech it, in general, what I've seen is just still way too high. Uh, you know, outside of us, uh, Europe in particular, is still way too high. Uh, I don't know what's happening. We're also seeing uh, sort of a bifurcation in terms of what's been versus tech, and, and I think the things that are more tech and seeing premium valuations. The things that are more really just a traditional finance company with a little bit of debt on our website, um, I think they're struggling a lot more. Uh, a year ago, that was probably not the case. Like, you could have raised a lot of money and basically pretended to be tech. Um, and I think right now that's a lot more challenging, for, uh, even though that could be a great business for a lot of people. Does anyone want to jump in on this and keep adding to that? Because I've heard this from other uh, fintech CEOs. Don't they have to ride along top of the sit along at the top of the incumbents? Well, and that's the other threat is that the incumbents offer generally crap on the UX consumers across the board in every single pack that we've all seen. And that promoter for banks or insurers or asset managers, right? Um, and so that is the extent which they're trying to displace. 
replace these folks in the beginning, yes, they are. They are two for leverage in some part of the structure, but always with them. And I would say that the strategic who has the sucky user experience, right, and the startup who has the delightful user experience, Jay, you, you spun Propel out of BPD Compass, right, which is a large multinational bank. Um, where do you think the banks and traditional financial institutions, you know, where do they fit in with, with these fintech companies? Pretty long the ability of startups to have a much better service than just the way It's fortunate. Do you want to talk about how your firm, um, your firm is very different, right? It's an impact-driven firm. You, you, you focus uh, you, on the underbank of the Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so so we focus on what we call everyday Americans. So everyday meeting, you know, basically everyone from ev except for like the top one or five percent of Americans who we think are very much financially well served already. Um, it's really everyone else where technology enables a better user experience, enables services they wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, and basically, we're a financially driven investment. So yes, we're looking for a value creation, but we're looking for, for financial returns and everyone else up here. Um, but we are looking to think that it's come through creating greater likelihood value, for creating better products, and we're looking for back to the use over and over again. Talk about why fin and tech make sense together. There's really two sources of value. One is operational cost savings. Um, which allows you to drive down the cost of the product because ultimately, al almost all of these products are commodity anyway. 
Um, and the second is an improved user experience or brand that increases lifetime value. So the likelihood for someone to repeat and use your product over and over again. Um, and we think that those things combined create a lot of value for small businesses and for consumers, and that improves to the enterprise. Um, okay, all of you, I mean, to, to kind of turn a little bit, all of you are fintech focused funds uh, and, a bit, and a bit smaller funds. I think, uh, Jay, maybe you write the biggest checks here. Uh, you talk about how you work with some of the traditional, you know, large, you thought you came from Mayfield, right? A big, big top tier, you know, A round fund. How do you guys work with the non-sector specific funds? Um, well, I, I think it's important for us to do so, right? You know, we're dependent, at least on the real EC stage side, on getting follow-on funding. Um, and, you know, I think the way that we articulate it is that, um, you know, we're going to do the work um, at the very early stage to help companies do that validation phase, right? And I think if you look at the larger funds, right, they're, you know, have doubled or tripled or quadrupled assets in the fashion, right? So doing a 500K tech typically doesn't move the deal for them, right? And so when they do find an idea that they think is interesting, um, an entrepreneur that's compelling, an area that, you know, think is unique and going to transition, whether it's more technology driven, um, you know, they're looking to smaller funds and, and then others um, to help, you know, kind of support that company. And, you know, it's an exchange of value, right? If I do that, if I invest, help support that entrepreneur and that company, right, then it grows and some of them, you know, get to the point where they can be invested by the larger funds, right? So I think it's a very nice ecosystem right now um, in the Valley, and I think it's a natural kind of evolution of, you know, the larger funds taking on more assets. And it's created real opportunity, and I think it's created opportunity for us to be on the forefront with entrepreneurs that are disrupting spaces, right? There isn't the pattern recognition that you typically get from an enterprise software company with a lot of partners here. So, you know, walking in with, you know, kind of, I've seen 25 companies in this space within insurance, I can get on the phone and tell, honestly, what I think, good or bad, about that entrepreneur company. And that is how you build a relationship that, that hopefully helps your portfolio. Does anyone dare to comment if, if they think the, uh, these top tier VCs really understand financial services? I would say, like, um, most of the people who are investors are actually consumer internet investors who cross the bridge and realize that, wow, there's this point of view to come to the services to the consumer. And so have tended to focus on, you know, solutions for consumers in ways that are basically relevant to the standard. For us, only on this, that we come at things very directly from a capital market standpoint. And when we have conversations about, well, how are the credit markets going to react to this kind of business model, for instance, we don't generally find that there are people inside most of the traditional Silicon Valley firms who are particularly well suited to that conversation. And there are some, and there are pockets here and there. But I think for entrepreneurs, um, one of the key questions ends up being, what is your business at the end of the day? Is it a financial services business? that's technology enabled, or is it a technology company that happens to like focus on like a somewhat trivial financial services function? Uh, and that has huge implications for who you end up selecting as venture folks and how your business model evolves. Yeah, and oftentimes you'll want multiple people around the table. I think you'll, you know, a lot of companies, to Ben's point, you've, you've got these two different components. We talked to a company that's a marketplace with a financial services component. You know, they're probably gonna want an investor on around the table who has experience in marketplaces, and they probably want a financial services experienced investor as well who can help them guide through that piece of it. So it's really about you know, figuring out board composition, investor composition, to get all those different pieces. There's nothing wrong with having someone who doesn't understand FinTech, but understands consumer internet really well around the table if you're a startup, if you're a consumer facing FinTech startup. The only thing I'd add is the, the alumni that, that uh, from PayPal are probably the only guys that uh, are that I've seen repeatedly add value in fintech investments. And why do you think that is? Just because they spent time at PayPal. They understand how hard it is to be at least a payments company. So I guess we need some more guys coming into the lending space. We need some more insurance guys. Todd probably knows all of them. Uh, you know, 
and all these other more difficult spaces are finally just getting some attention. Okay, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Um, uh, here's a good one. Uh, you know, I've I, I've seen a lot of these things that fintechs are um, maybe traditional financial services being marketed in a different way, but I, I'm waiting to see some of the, the craziest ideas in fintech. What are some of the wackiest ideas you've seen or the biggest ideas that may or may not work that you've seen recently? You guys are all looking to me. Okay, well, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say wacky, but again, I think one of the themes that we're looking at is just the demographics of aging in the United States, right? And we're starting to see a transition from the baby boomers kind of leading consumer spend and they clearly dominate asset management, um, but to the next generation. But um, one of the interesting things, if you, you look at just the agent population of, you know, insurance agents, real estate agents, you know, financial services, you know, everybody trying to sell a service, right? That population of people are aging dramatically, right? So, you know, average age of a guardian life insurance agent is 65, right? So you got to think about, well, how are they going to replace the connection to the consumer that they don't have as a company themselves, right? And so I think that creates an opportunity for technology to be there. And so I'm starting, and there's a lot of room to, um, you know, kind of market to the consumer, right? It costs on average anywhere from two to two, 2,600 bucks to get a life insurance customer. You can pay a lot of things for that consumer now. Um, and so I think you're going to see a lot of wacky, cool ideas around how do I win that consumer and then sell them a term life product from one of these large insurance companies and I've just become a technology enabled agency, right? And the 65 year old can go from playing golf twice a week to five days a week. Yeah, I'd say broadly three threads of maybe wackiness to your point. Like one is everything distribution for sure. Any financial product, trying to find new ways to sell to people. The other is everyone is an investor apparently today and like there's a robo advisor for every little niche population imaginable. Um, and everyone wants to invest in everything from startups to foreign currency to marketplace lending. There's, there's, everyone should be investing all the time on your own. And I think that is a big change from the way everyone used to think. The last thing is everyone is a lender and that there is like no niche too small where there isn't somebody trying to originate loans on mobile devices in that niche, whether it's we met with a company that wants to essentially, if you're an app developer, Apple's not paying you fast enough, like we'll lend against your app downloads, right? Um, uh, you know, to I think Todd, you were telling me about like people who unload trucks who get paid in cash and like that should be something that you can lend against. I mean, there's no shortage of niches and after a while it's sort of like everyone is either borrowing or lending or investing or spending or getting sold things on their mobile phone and it's like, what's, you know, what else are you doing with your time besides investing and borrowing and spending and lending? Does anyone else want to share really quickly? I'm getting the sign to hook hook me. Um. Uh, I've seen some startups who want to buy a bank and are raising like thirty or forty million dollars to do that, which seems pretty wacky. Definitely wacky. Probably the most fun thing we saw most recently is a guy, like a really good technologist, that are trying to use your mobile phone to capture uh, events on the road. So using this as a cam. Uh, drive cam, it would identify your license plate and actually record when you are not driving well and uploading this to the to the cloud. They've got deep data scientists that are, are, would then eventually be able to report on you as a driver. Uh, so for the insurance industry, potentially really interesting, uh, but just the, the complexities of what they're trying to do, uh, amazing, uh, but a little wacky. I'm going to start the startup that hides your license plate from that technology. And there's a lot of there's a lot of like drones. There's a lot of drones now in insurance that'll like fly over your house and whatever. But the, the wackiest startup though is clearly like the craziest company, the firm. This little right. business. Okay. Uh, can we do we have time for a couple of questions or should we wrap? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun to talk to you.